You are listening to the Real Estate Influencer Podcast. All right, welcome to the Real Estate Influencer Podcast. Today's show is going to be awesome uh, for a number of different reasons, but today you get two mats for the price of one, and not just two mats, two bald mats, which is, I mean, yeah, there it is. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. So we want to welcome you to the Real Estate Influencer Podcast. This is the podcast for real estate coaches, speakers, product creators, software developers, group leaders, marketers, and entrepreneurs. Basically, if you are a leader, if you're an influencer in the real estate world, you are in the right place. And today we've got a major influencer in the real estate world, my good friend, Matt Terrio. What's up, Matt? What's up, Maddie? Good to see you. Good to see you too, buddy. How you been? Doing well. Doing well. I mean, all things considering, you know, we're yep. playing playing the pandemic game and right. Uh, yeah, but you're just been. yeah, but you're doing great stuff, man. I've been watching you over the last few months. You haven't missed a beat. You and your wife Mercedes are are killing it with the turnkey properties and and helping students uh, do a lot of deals still and learning. People are starting real estate investing during this pandemic, and you're helping them do that. So. Uh, congratulations on everything that's been going on. So, um, so let's just, let's give everybody, you know, I, I know you, uh, I've known you for a long time, right? So let me give some people an introduction who maybe have heard your name, but don't know a lot about you. Uh, Matt Terrio is Epic Real Estate Investing, right? That's one of his main brands. Uh, a lot of you have probably listened to his podcast. He is one of the top podcasts in the real estate investing world. He's been doing it for a long time, but also is just uh, just one of the best. And I've been really fortunate to, to do a podcast with you. We did the Hold That House podcast, which yes. was awesome. And you've got an amazing studio set up there and uh, just an amazing office and uh, film studio and everything. Um, you put out a ton of videos, a lot of content that, that your students eat up. You're active on YouTube, active on Facebook. Uh, you've got really successful coaching programs. Uh, so for those of you guys that don't know Matt, he is one of the big dogs in real estate coaching, right? But he's also a big dog in the real estate investing world. So Matt, let's just start talking about, you know, you, you do a lot of deals, you, you have rental properties, you have a big turnkey business. Um, you know, talk about, you know, how you kind of started there and then how you kind of went into and parlayed that into the educational world and coaching and, and how those two worlds kind of mix. Sure. I mean, my, my background was originally in the music business and I did that for 15 years or so. And then the, right. the digital download came and just kind of turned that whole thing upside down. I don't know if you, anyone remembers that website called Napster. That seems so ancient. That's such an ancient I name. I, I, I have to tell you, I was part of the problem. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I was, a, I was a kid and they told me all of a sudden all music ever made is free. I, I couldn't help myself. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so there's, once that genie was let out of the bottle, there was no going back. And it was a big scramble of how people were going to make money from music that had been accustomed to making their living from music. And uh, those that figured it out stayed, but there was a, probably about 50,000 of us in the music industry that didn't figure it out in time. So yeah. I had to go find something else to do. And uh, I, it was, I was 34 years old. So I was like midlife and I was, uh, I thought I was on my way. I thought I was going to be the next Diddy. You, you know? were in LA, you were in LA then just like you are now, right? In Los uh, Angeles. Yeah. I'm in Las Vegas now. We just moved. Vegas, here about right. a year ago. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so I had to go find something else to do and I really missed my money. So I was like, okay, so whatever I'm going to learn new, I want to make sure it's profitable. Like there's a, there's no income ceiling on it and all roads short, long story short, all roads pointed, pointed to real estate. So I did what I thought would be the logical thing to do. I went and got a real estate license. It only took me four years to figure out that uh, in the agent world is not where all the money's at in real estate. It's actually on the other side of the desk. So then I made a very large investment in my own real estate investing education. And I just did what they told me to do. And, you know, like so many entrepreneurs these days and probably more, more real estate entrepreneurs, the little book, uh, you've probably never heard of it, Matt. It's called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm. And have you heard of this one? It's, yeah. it's actually really good. I highly recommend it. Like um, Kawasaki, I think. Kawasaki. Yeah. Is that his name? Kawasaki. Yeah, that yeah. guy. And, uh, you know, it just introduced me to this concept of this rat race escape formula to where you get your monthly passive income to exceed your monthly expenses to create financial freedom. And to me, financial freedom, and to very many people that, that I knew, financial freedom meant you had a lot of money in the bank. And so that was always the, the 
the goal was to get a lot of money in the bank and just stack your paper, right? But um, that gave me a whole new definition on it and a whole new way to pursue the second half of my life, which was not to focus so much on creating the mountains of money, but focus more on creating the streams of money. And if that replenished each and every month, then you were good to go. So I was able to do that in about three and a half, four years. And um, I wasn't rich, but I didn't have to work, which was really, really cool. Yeah. So that's, that's, a big, that's a big defining thing too, that not just piling up a bunch of money, but having streams of income, right? There's a big difference there because you know, you, we see a lot of people win the lottery, right? And then five years later, they're, they're completely broke again, right? They piled up a lot of money. There was a lot of money yeah. there, but they didn't have the right uh, methodology, the techniques. They didn't have any streams of ongoing income. And, and I, yeah. you and I always talk passive income. We're all about the buy and hold and, and we're all about, you know, ongoing income. So I love that. We always, we always, uh, our conversations always seem to go there at some point, right? Yeah, totally. So now we're at the point where kind of the, the introduction of education came into play because your family, your friends, your network, your associates, they knew you just a few years ago, you were bagging groceries for $7 an hour. And now I'm playing golf on a Tuesday. And they're like, uh, what happened? How'd you make that transition? So I entertained a lot of dinner meetings, a lot of coffees, a lot of lunches, people wanting to pick my brain. I don't know how many times I heard that. Let me just pick your brain to see how you did it. Pick your brain. Pick a your pu brain. Public service announcement. If you ever want to talk to me or Matt or any other influencer that you perceive as somebody that could help you, don't ask to pick our brains, all right? That, that sounds terrible. disgusting. And we don't need free meals either, all right? Like free meal is not, that's not, oh, really? You're going to take me to Denny's? Like that's not a big thing, all right? Come at us with something better than that. Be creative. But don't, don't pick our brains okay right. please <laughs> <laughs> i don't have very much of it left so yeah leave right, it right. Uh, there's only so much to go around yeah correct. so i started listening I, I stumbled upon podcasts trying to figure out how the education world worked and came across this one podcast of uh um sean terry and nathan drewitt and i, I forget network marketing no yeah. internet marketing internet mobile. marketing mogul i remember it man it was, yeah. yes yeah, and I, and I we're going to see you and I will see. Both, we're going to see both those guys in just a few days. Actually, we're going to be yep. hanging out with both those guys. Yep. So funny you mentioned them. Yeah. So I was I was trying to figure out what I was going to, and I was introduced to this world of creating passive income through like membership websites. So that was the whole goal right there was let me create this asset online where people just come along. I, I'll record all this information, tell them exactly how I did, so I don't have to do these lunch meetings anymore. I can preserve some of that brain. And then they'll come in, buy access to the members area. They can learn how to do it. And then we're done. And this thing's just going to make money while I sleep. That was the whole idea. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, only to find 10 years later, it's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> right? But um, that was the initial introduction into, into uh, education. Yeah. So podcast. So that was the first podcast you listened to, Sean Terry and Nathan Jurowitz. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. And maybe you can talk a little bit about this because – a lot of people that know you, I think they first come to know you through the podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Through the Epic podcast. And I know a lot of your students, a lot of your coaching students come through that. Um, I think that might've been, you know, before I met you personally, that might've been the first place I saw you there and, and YouTube, you put out that was great. 2009, Matt. 2009. Yeah. So you've been yeah, doing this, you've been at this over a decade now. So you've been podcasting, podcasting yeah. since, since podcasts were podcasts basically, yep. right? No one and, even knew what a podcast was when I did it. I came home and said, Mercedes, we're going to do a podcast. He's like, what's a podcast? <laughs> yeah. You know, well, you nobody. started it at, at a time, you know, similar to, I think I started mine, you know, uh, and it's one that I don't have anymore, but the Real Estate Freedom Podcast, which I had for just a couple of years around that same time. And back then, uh, there, weren't, there wasn't much competition, right? I mean, now right. there are literally thousands of podcasts and certainly hundreds of podcasts in some side of real estate, right? But back then... Um, you know, uh, e even a marginal quality podcast, like yours is really good. Mine at the time, it was, let's just say it, it was marginal. It was just okay. I just kind of like, it was just pulling it out, you know, pulling it out of thin air. Um, but I still ranked, I was still on like, you know, the top right. 10 in different categories on iTunes and it doesn't really work like that anymore. Right. I mean, you've got to really have some quality. You've got to have some, some context, some history and just, you know, some really, uh, good marketing techniques to, to be ranking now and to kind of be in that mix because it's it's a lot different than it was back then, right? It is very much so. And I really don't know what it takes to rank because I'm getting more downloads than I've ever gotten before. And I'm completely off the charts now. Like I don't even appear on them anymore. 
It's like, yeah. how do I get up there? And then I, I look at some people that are up and I scratch my head like, how did they get up there? You know? Uh, so I'm just, you know, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a mystery, but the world of podcasting has taken over and you, you have so many people coming over to the platform that can't, are bringing their audiences from somewhere else, mm-hmm. whether it's TV or they have a, a radio show or, you know, they, they got, maybe they got started on YouTube or people on Instagram are now starting podcasts. So they're bringing a giant audience with them from somewhere else. And it's just really like suppressing so much stuff. Like there's only so much room to, to squeeze through. So. Yeah. But you're still getting a lot of downloads. I mean, I still, you know, people are still in our real estate investing world. They're still talking about your podcast. I mean, that's, that's. Oh yeah. Something in like and I said, itself. we're getting more than we ever have. Yeah. But unless you knew me back then, it, I don't know how you're going to discover me unless it's just word of mouth. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So let, let's talk about, let's talk about how you're using, because I think a lot of people that are listening, um, some of them might have podcasts, some of them might want to start podcasts. If, I feel like everybody's got a podcast right now, right? So, you know, people that flip one property, now they got a podcast and stuff, you know, and they've got all this stuff to offer. <laughs> but, but I saw two but, of those this morning, right in my, right in my Facebook feed. And you won't see, and you won't check. see them again, right? Yeah, and you now I'm a coach. <laughs> and you won't see them again, fly by nighters, right? And, and right. You, you see a lot of that because uh, with Facebook, and there's less barrier to entry as far as at least being seen or spending mm-hmm. a few bucks on ads showing up for a month or two before they disappear. But, but let's talk about, you know, how, how that works. You know, when you have a podcast, you're, you're very successfully parlaying that into your live events. Um, obviously not so much in the pandemic world, right? But you're doing live digital events. Uh, mm-hmm. You have a lot of students. I mean, you have a thriving coaching business, a lot of students in group coaching, and you even have, you know, high paid one-on-one uh, coaching students that you work with on, on in some ways. Sometimes you have products and a lot of that I know is fed by the podcast. So, you know, what's the thought process? What's your intake process? What kind of things do you do on the podcast that bring those people in? Where do they go? What kind of landing pages? Kind of walk us through the process for how you turn an audience on a podcast into those students and turn that into money. Perfect. Um, Yeah. In in the beginning, I had no idea, but I had the right strategy, you know, luckily. Mm -hmm. And that strategy was just first, I think is to be 100% 100% just be yourself. Don't pretend to be some caricature or, or, or brag or the fake it till you make it type thing. Cause in the early years, I was just very humble and honest. I'd share as many much about my failures and my struggles as I did my successes. Yeah. Um, I remember you talking a lot about bagging groceries. I mean, I remember hearing that yeah. on your podcast way back in the day, like, Hey, I was a, I was a big time producer and then I was bagging groceries. <laughs> you know, and now, and now I've, you know, now I'm doing other yeah. things and we're doing pretty well now, but I, I remember that. I remember thinking, man, just a couple of years ago, when I first started listening to your podcast, yeah. just a couple of years before that, he was, he was bagging groceries, man, you know, had to put money on the table for the family. So it's yeah. crazy. And so I think that was number one. And then, uh, two was to, um, just give it all away. Just give everything away. And we were quickly moving into a world where anything that you wanted to learn or know, could be found with a couple Google searches, right? And so the kind of lift, keeping a, a locked door from all the quote unquote good stuff um, didn't feel like it was a good strategy. It felt a little bit uh, intellectually dishonest. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I, I want people to hire me as a coach. I want them to pay for education. It's a good second stream of income to addition to my, my real estate. But um, I was just kind of like, I wasn't going to beg. I wasn't going to try and trick. I wasn't going to play any games. And so I just, I built a really good following and a loyal following from that angle. Mm -hmm. And so that was the second thing that I think was, was key to my success. The third thing was probably certainly consistency, right? Yeah. Um, If you are inconsistent with your, your podcast, it's hard for uh, an audience uh, to really latch on to you. Yeah. Um, and, and that was the thing happening. I made with my early podcast. I stopped doing it and then tried to start back up again a year later. And it was just like, they had all, I think they all went to your podcast and never came back. Yeah. Crickets. Again. Right. Yeah. yeah. I had a couple. I'm, breaks. I'm actually glad they did because you're better at this than I am. So it's better. <laughs> <laughs> but I had a couple of those breaks. So that's how I know consistency works. Cause it took me a while to build it back up after I took a three or four month break from doing it. Yep. And then, um, you know, injecting your calls to action in a very organic way right? Um, incorporating your calls to action, whether typically it's going to be a free download of something, mm-hmm. but make it a free download in context of what you're talking about. Yep. 
Well, I've kind of divided. And by the way, if you'd like everything that Matt Terrio is talking about, you can go right now to the pit. No, (laughs) don't do that, right? I like that, exactly. Um, So I've I've divided my my business up into three components. It's the attract, convert, and exit. Mm -hmm. So attract is obviously your lead generation, your marketing. The convert is that how that conversation with the seller goes and how you get the contract signed. And the third is the exit strategy, how you're going to profit from the deal. Are you going to flip it? Are you going to uh, fix it or hold it? Or are you going to finance it? And so those are like, kind of, so I had a handful of different downloads on, on like I think I had eight or nine different landing pages. And so just depending on what I was talking about, I could direct them to that one landing page that was completely congruent with what I was talking about. And those opt-ins just from a podcast were abundant and, yeah. and free. So yeah. that, that was, I think that was, I was on the right move there. And then, uh, probably didn't do it enough actually early on. I probably could have gathered a, a lot, generated a lot more leads and a lot more potential clients. Yeah. If I was a little bit more aggressive with it, but I was still always kind of like, eh, I don't want to push, I don't want to push the envelope too much. I don't want to like uh, come off too salesy as they would say. So what, what changed you from feeling like you were being too salesy to making that kind of that ask of your audience and making that ask, like what, what changed there? You realized what? Um, re- rephrase that question for me. I so, think- okay. Well, say so you didn't do that very much in the beginning because you thought you were being too oh, salesy. Right. You were afraid to make that ask. You were kind of maybe not afraid, but you were hesitant to say, go to this page and get this free tool. Like, why did you come around to that later? Like what made you come around to that? Why did you, why were you not hesitant? Why are you not hesitant of that today? Super. So I enrolled in a couple of different coaching programs. I've always got a mentor. I'm always spending a lot of money on my network and always a lot of money on my mentorship the people I look up to. And I came across a guy, uh, Taki Moore, who's a coach of coaches mm-hmm. of all industries and kind of, he yeah. really helped me structure my entire business and, and that coaching business, the coaching fulfillment. And I just remember the first time I got on a call with him and he took me through a 30 minute introduction call. And I was like, that was the most amazing thing I've ever been on. And I know my clients aren't even getting close to that experience. Yeah. Right. So that, that shifted a, a lot, but part of the marketing aspect of it was, he was like, you need to ask more. But then he taught me a certain way to ask. It was like, uh, you give in public and you ask in private was his mantra. Mm. And then, uh, so I was with Taki for three or four years. And that's kind of where I made this, that leap from the six figure to seven year, seven figure coaching business with him. And then, uh, I spent a year with Frank Kern mm-hmm. and was in his, uh, top mastermind. And you know, yep. he's one of the, he's the godfather, right? I really think he is. And he's, he's one of the top four of the original four people. Yeah. No, that Frank, sort of, Frank is awesome, man. Frank, Frank totally. gets it. Yeah. And he just, he just said really simple, like ask the more offers you make, the more money you make. Mm-hmm. So I really just put that to the test and by golly, if he didn't know what he was talking about <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know, and it, and it was funny. I did some, I did all kinds of testing and split testing. Like even like when you, you get you. See, I'm on a bunch of people's email list. I always want to know what everyone's doing. And you'll, you'll get into those little promotions of people and they'll, you know, they'll send out, uh, you know, 12 hours left, 10 hours left, eight hours left. You better hurry. There's only six hours left. And you get like seven or eight um, emails from one person, like in one afternoon, I'm just, and on the receiving side, I'm like, this is annoying. I never want to annoy my people like this. Yeah. Uh, But I went and tried it. And every time I sent an email, I get, you know, one or two people, Hey, you need to chill out on the email, but I got six or seven sales from it. Yeah. So I was like, okay, well you just don't belong on my list. These people actually wanted it and they just, I just needed to remind them again. Yeah. Right. But once I really got comfortable with that connection, it was, um, that was where the, I guess the big shift really happened. Yeah. Well that's, you know, that, that's a big shift and, and that's, you know, I think you're right. You, you will get rid of the people that shouldn't have been on the list anyway. Right. And you'll lose, like you said, you lost a couple, but then you got, you had a whole barrage of sales when you did that. And obviously you don't do that every day. You don't be like, Oh, eight hours left on this thing. Now six hours. Oh, it's another thing today. And it's today, you know, you don't do that shutdown sequence every day, but there's a place for that. Right. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's creating urgency in your people. That's, uh, that's creating the desire to, you know, the, the fear of loss in them. Right. And I think the key to that and, and what I know with you is you really do and really live and really believe what you're teaching, right? And I think that's the key to this whole thing 
if you believe what you're doing and, and you know that it works and you know, hey, I'm pushing you to get this thing or buy this thing or come into this program or download this thing, whatever it is, but I'm doing that because I'm talking, you know, you, Matt Terrio is doing this because Matt Terrio knows that his stuff works because he's mm -hmm. seen it work. He's done it himself. He's seen it work with other students. He's seen it work in multiple markets, you know, that type of thing. Then, then that should give you the confidence to be able to do that, right? And so I think a lot of people are afraid to make the ask when they begin because they're not totally confident in their own stuff or their own ability. Or in some cases, even with people that have been in the business a long time, some, some of whom you and I both know um, that don't really, they're not really in the business, right? And they represent like they're flipping properties every day or doing this or doing that. And they're not really doing that. Um, then they don't have the confidence in a lot of ways to do that or push mm -hmm. that way. Um, and even if they do push that way, it doesn't come across to the audience because it's inauthentic, right? Because right. you can tell when somebody doesn't really believe in the stuff they're selling, right? When it's, when it's somebody that's just a carnival barker and they don't really believe in it, you can sense that, you know, and you can sense that over time too. So, um, you know, and that's one of the things about podcasts that I really like. Um, and especially with a consistent podcast like you've done for so long, it really gives people an opportunity to get to know the real you. Right. And I know that they feel like, you know, after they've listened to five episodes, 10 episodes, 50 episodes, because you've got, you know, how many episodes on some of your podcasts now? What, what are some of the episode counts up to at this point? Like 1700 or something like that. 1700, right? I was listening to, you know, James Shramko the other day. I was listening to episode 789. You're double that, right? I mean, I thought that was a lot. You're up to 1500 episodes of some of this stuff. So these people really know you, right? So talk a little bit about how, you know, the difference in the quality of a lead that comes from your podcast, mm. from somebody that's been listening for a year, or even, even, you know, listen to 15 or 20 podcasts versus somebody who came into your funnel through Facebook and found out about you yesterday and then came in. Um, talk about like the difference in those quality of leads. Cause I think yeah, that's it, big. It's night and day. Yeah. Right. Um, the people that come through the podcast, that come through the YouTube channel um, are just totally different leads than the type we try to generate on demand through a Facebook ad or a Google pay-per-click ad, something like that. Um, Cause they come in, they know you, they trust you. Um, typically they like you. And what I've noticed by, and the one thing I'd mentioned when you're doing a podcast where you want to be a hundred percent yourself is you attract people like yourself and it makes working with people a whole lot more enjoyable. Because when we do, uh, when I get to meet with people in live events and with our private coaching group, we do private fulfillment events where they come to the office and we just, we deliver, right? Mm -hmm. with, without the sales environment there, hold their hand and, and help them just kind of drag and drop, plug and play and point and click and then train them how to use everything. Um, and then we go out afterwards. And those are people I probably hang out most of the time with anyway. Yeah. And so I think being yourself is really key. And so when those people come to you through the, uh, your content, let's just say that, mm. that uh, it's an easier conversion. I mean, they've already bought, they reached out to you because they want to do this. So it's, it's really for your job to, to mess it up. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, and you, then the way you would mess it up is by being different in person when they show up to meet you than you exactly. were on the podcast. Right. So, so then exactly. one or the other, they know that, it, that there's an incongruency there. One of the others a put on. Either you were faking it the whole time in the podcast and now this is the real you, you're a jerk in person mm -hmm. or, you know, vice versa. You know, this is, mm -hmm. you know, so, and I remember, I mean, this has been years ago. I remember coming out and speaking at one of your events and I just remember, um, I just remember how you really kind of just chilled with your people and it's a couple things really stuck out to me. One was because they'd come through your podcast and then come into your coaching programs and now they're in the same room with you. Um, the, the feel of the event was totally different than like a selling event or what you, you know, might be used to at a, at a real estate investor association or at a pitch fest or something like that. It was totally different, right? People felt like they knew you and then you got up on stage, you looked and sounded just like you did on the podcast. Everything was congruent. And then I remember, uh, and it was a pretty big group too, but I remember like, you know, uh, we went out to dinner afterwards and had a kind of a big reception afterwards. I think two nights in a row we did that. And I was having so much fun because everybody was just loving the fact that it wasn't, you know, they weren't being hard sold something. It was congruent. It was the same, it, you know, you were the same both places. 
you hung out with them, you, you had drinks with them, you had dinner with them. It wasn't like you were sitting at your table and your throne and they got to come touch your cloth and stuff like that. I mean, uh, some of them might've been starstruck because they've been listening to you for a long time. But then as soon as they talked to you, it was like, oh man, Matt's just cool. You know, Matt's mm -hmm. cool just like on the podcast and Mercedes, his wife is cool. And so that, that really uh, made an impression on me coming to speak to your people because I saw the way they looked at you, respected you, felt like they knew you, right? And then got to see the real you and, and, and that reinforced all that. And uh, it was so different in a lot of ways than other events that I'd been to and, and even some other events that I had been asked to speak at. And, uh, and I was like, man, you know, I don't really do live events in this, you know, in this world, but if I did, this is how I would want to do them. I'd want to do them where people come and I'm just really being authentically Matt Terrio in my case, authentically Matt Andrews and yeah, really yeah. just, you know, uh, being congruent and then helping people. And that attracts the right kind of people, right? Because I saw people, you know, with, with not even really selling, I saw people jumping on board, wanting more, almost asking you, what's my next step? What can I do? Can I do this with you? Can I do that with you? Um, and I, I just saw that kind of happening. And, and when it happens that way, it's just cool. It's more fun for you, right? It's more fulfilling. Um, so I, I love that, man. And so talk to me about um, the live events. I know right now you've tweaked it uh, for the digital uh, events, right? So give us a kind of a snapshot on what you were doing, how many live in-person events uh, you were doing and were on track to do uh, in 2020 and then how you've kind of shifted into the digital because I know you've had a lot of success making that shift. And I know at first you were kind of wondering, you know, we were talking, you're a member of Family Mastermind. We were talking in our mastermind and, and uh, you were like, you told us at the time you weren't sure how well this was going to go, but then you ended up being pretty pleasantly surprised at how well it went. So kind of talk about that switching over, what you were doing and then what you switched to and how the transition went. Sure. So just at the end of 2019, I finally decided I'm going to be an adult business owner and I hired a, a CFO, right? Oh. And uh, it was, he was very expensive and it was a little bit, to, it was a lot to, to bite off. And, but I just kind of felt like I, I'd been stagnant for four or five years. We'd earned the same thing gross wise, just about the same every year. But it seemed like our profit was getting a little bit smaller each year. And uh, so I hired him to come in and we, he just did an analysis on everything. And we just kind of picked out the points in the business that were the most profitable. And what that pointed to was our live events. So we were doing three, four live events a year, um, which what I've come to discover in our world is not very many at all. Mm -hmm. But uh, boy, when we run a real estate business, a turnkey business, the education business, we have our Epic Wealth Fund. Um, to put on a live event and coordinate that, I mean, that's a, quite the undertaking for, for my staff and still manage everything else. So we couldn't really handle any more than four years. But yeah, decided, when, you, okay. when you put on a live event, like you, you have no bandwidth for anything else while that week's going on, really. I mean, right. you're, you're there hundred percent, right? Exactly. But it was where the big cash infusions came. It's where the big profit center was. And what, so we decided, okay, what can we start eliminating? We're going to start chopping stuff off. And this was like in October, November ish. And this was right at the time where, I forget which if, which alphabet it is. It's FTC, SCC, some, but one of those three letters um, came in and shut down two of the biggest uh, event companies in, in the country. Yeah. Right. That hold, you know, one company will hold 10 events every single weekend in 10 different cities. I mean, this was like a quite a different scale and quite the undertaking. Mm -hmm. And so what I noticed was, oh my God, there's a bunch of really good talent right now out of work with nothing to sell. And so I did some research and investigating as to why they were shut down. And it was almost always on the lack of fulfillment, keeping the promises that were made on stage. And that has never been our problem. Like we're always the, we're always the over, over deliver company. We've always been that. We've always struggled with trying to convince people that this is something that they should do. Like the, the sales conversion process was always part of that we kind of lacked on. Maybe because I was just a little too transparent and too real with people. Like saying, if you don't want to work, you should just go home now, you know? And so I'd, I'd have those types of conversations with, with our audience. But um, I went out and just started making some phone calls and just recruited an absolute dream team of marketers uh, to drive the leads to the events. Um, a setup guy who comes in, he, he 
lands in one city, does three little free 45 minute events that sells a ticket to the three day event. Mm -hmm. And so we just set that up. I, I got to, uh, some of the, the best people. I got the number one guy from Zurich's on my team doing my stage presentation. Yeah. And I mean, this guy is responsible for hundreds of millions of dollars in sales over the last four or five years. So that, that model, just to kind of clarify that for people that, so he comes in beforehand about how, how far before the actual three day events, does he come in and right. then what kind of, what's the format of that first event that he runs? Super. So we have one setup guy and then one three day stage guy that runs the thing. So the setup guy will come into a city two weeks before the event. He'll sell that three day event. And then two weeks later, the other guy shows up in that same city to fulfill on what the other guy sold. Gotcha. So they leapfrog each other. So the, the setup guy is in the next city the next week and the next city, the next week, and the next city, the next week. And the, the guy that does the presentation, he's always two weeks behind. Mm -hmm. so he's just okay. following him around the country. So, so that, fir that first meeting, the first guy is kind of doing the, what they call like a preview. Is that, mm -hmm. is that kind of that model? Okay. Yep. 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 And it was something I was like, it just seemed like it was so much work and I never wanted to take that on. It just seemed like, Oh my God, how do you do that? You know, in San Merrill at fortune builders, I mean, there's like 10 a weekend, right? Yeah. Just yeah. Like, oh, it's a, it's a live funnel. Yeah. Yeah. He's got two people work full time just doing hotel and plane tickets. For, the, for all the teams. That's all they do yeah. all day long is book plane tickets and hotels rooms. Crazy. But um, so we did that. And so we started, we launched that first, that whole endeavor started in mid January. Um, started off a little slow, still learning. It's a, it's a new process for us. And, but it got a little better, a little better, a little better. And then we hit March and we hit our stride. And with those first two weekends, I mean, we had, it was going to be my first seven figure a month. Mm -hmm. And, and that one, we'd only done two events and I was already at seven figures that month or yeah, two, two weekends. I had seven figures and then COVID hit. And, and then the just, world, then the world had other plans. <laughs> the world had other plans. Yeah. yeah. So we were left with a giant marketing bill. And then because of COVID, everyone freaked out and no one followed through with their payments. So it put us in a huge hole in, in March. Yeah. So we had, we panicked for the first 30 days, just like, like I think the rest of the world did. Like, what are we going to do? Especially if you were at any sort of live event business. Yeah. Um, Mercedes sister is a, is a wedding planner. So all weddings were just zoop, yeah. right off the table. Oh we yeah. Had another friend that. My uh, friends that were concert promoters, you know, yeah. uh, you know, my, my cousin, uh, Brett, who you'll actually meet pretty soon. I mean, he, he did 50 to 60 live keynote live paid keynotes per year and it was just like poof poof gone <laughs> you know like oh all those meetings all canceled all mm -hmm. of them every single one you know and so he had to shift big time fast yeah i've been listening to the joe rogan podcast recently and and how how that completely decimated the stand-up comedian industry too oh yeah Holy yeah God. i got a couple of friends that are you know kind of middle of the pack stand-up comedian working what they call working comedians right and these right. are guys who were they're working at least every other weekend a four or five night stand you know mm -hmm. setups to the big you know setups to the dave chappelle's and stuff like that the guys that are kind of right. the warm-ups for those guys you know and just yeah gone gone overnight so um yeah i mean you were and you were ramping up you were just ramping up and starting to have that success and then boom but then you shifted and it's working, right? So to talk yeah, about that. Much to my surprise, because I can't imagine being the consumer ever sitting through, sitting in front of the computer for three days for a virtual event. Yeah. That's just, I, I couldn't put that together. I couldn't fathom it. Yeah. That anyone would do that. And we put on the first event and by golly, they sure did. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. It was the, the, the amazing part of it is our um, dollars per buying unit is which is how we 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 uh, record that how many individual buying units so a couple would be one buying unit so we mm -hmm. have these individuals and that dial, dollar per head wasn't too different than the live event but the expense was way down yeah. right because it's a virtual event there's no hotel there's no travel you don't yeah need this giant team you don't need all this stuff and no lunches like, no happy hours no yeah nothing yeah yeah, yeah. So it was like i I think uh, a lot of people in our industry and a lot of people that you, you and I know, Matt, are probably, if they're not going to keep this as their entire business model, it'll certainly going to be a portion of it, a significant portion because of, because of that margin that was just created. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see, 
did that phenomenon happen because of COVID? Or when we open back up, will that disappear? It'll be interesting. Mm -hmm. I think, well, I think it will, to some extent, like you said, we will keep certain parts of that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so I know like, uh, well, you remember Family Mastermind, you know, we were going to, we were on a model where we met a few times a year in person and we're still doing, we're still going to do that. We're still going to meet in person, right? Mm -hmm. But when COVID hit, we started meeting much more frequently in uh, digital format masterminds, right? But so much growth happened in those sessions, in those digital sessions, and we could do shorter ones and make them more often because you weren't getting on a plane. You weren't making this big commitment. You could do a two hour thing or an hour and a half thing even, you right. know, like you've been in a lot of those, right? Like a quick hour and a half. It's great. You go on with the rest of your day. You're not sitting there Zoom beat out, right? Like a, like a Zoom beat or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and now, so we're definitely keeping a part of that. And I think a lot of people that switched, you know, from the live to the digital will at least keep some hybrid type model uh, because it's working. You know, a lot of our friends have, have done the same thing and, and all of them have been surprised somewhat and that uh, the sales still worked. Uh, the students still come on board <clears throat> if they have a sound platform and a sound teaching system like you do, uh, but no expenses. And that's a nice, that's a nice little shift because it's not just the expenses, right? I mean, you put on enough events now and dealt with enough hotels to know it's not just the expenses. It's, it's the life sucking that happens when you deal with hotels and yes. convention, convention services. And, you know, we're, we go through that still, you know, with some of the events we have coming up and it's just like, why does the Hyatt make this so hard? Like what do isn't it better for them if they don't make it this hard and waste this much time? Isn't the Marriott, wouldn't they be better served to not rake you over the coals like this? Like we could just make this happen, you know, and then everybody would be happier. And so I think a lot of that is uh, not just the savings, but just kind of the, the brain damage, which is mm -hmm. may, maybe why you're missing some of those brain cells you talked about earlier, you know, <laughs> yes. dealing with too many Hyatts and Marriott's in this world. And uh, that might be it. We, you know? we had an event, Matt, where we kept on, uh, we served coffee for the three days. And so we kept on filling the coffee pot for everyone in the room. When we got the final bill, the coffee cost more than the room itself. <laughs> yes. I yes. was like, what are you talking about? And it was crappy coffee. <laughs> yes. Those things are, those big giant jug things, those silver tubes, those are yeah. $800 a piece. I know. It's I insane. Like, so when you guys are drinking coffee at the next person's event, just cherish it and just, just realize it. Yeah. Really but, you're, but you are it. the price you're paying. It's almost like it would, that every bean was individually ground by, by a special man who had, who's an artist yes. and then brought yes. you, but it's not, it's just crappy Maxwell house, cheap as oh. cheap as they can buy. Right. It's not even Starbucks most of the times, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it's crazy. But so, so it worked though. I mean, the digital events yeah. are working. I mean, I know I've talked to you and Mercedes about it. You know, we, we've looked at, uh, you've, you've shared a lot of those numbers with me and the other members of Family Mastermind. I mean, it's, it's working, it's working well. So, so you're gonna keep some of that going to an extent, even right. when you We're, can do live events? going. And what, another place, and this is what I was gonna, I'm gonna share, is gonna be my give at our, next, um, at our next Family Mastermind. So everyone can get a little sneak peek on what that's gonna be. But yeah. uh, where I've been really, experiencing not only a, a good sales process and a good good revenue, but I think almost maybe even more fulfilling for me, it's been much more enjoyable is, and I got, I had played golf with Joe McCall, I don't know, a month ago, two months ago. Well, I guess it was almost three months ago now that I'm thinking about it. But um, he was kind of telling me what he was doing and I was like, well. Did you beat him? Huh? Did you beat him in golf? Oh, it was funny that we were both so terrible. Like we'd hit, we'd swing three times. Okay, that's enough for this hole. We just pick up and drive to the next one. <laughs> Why mess with the rules? Yeah. You know? Pro <laughs> protocol. Eh. But there was nobody on the course. It was just he and I. So we had a blast. But um, he introduced me to this concept, sharing with me, like started uh, hosting these little mini classes that are live classes, right? Yeah. Um, little one-day masterminds or little three-week courses where you meet on Zoom with a group of people. You charge a really low fee, but uh, you're always focused on one solution for one person, right? What's the one problem that that person has? What can you just dive in and go deep on that thing? And so that's been really good too. That's something I'm probably going to keep as well. Yeah. And what I've found is with that interaction with, with the client, um, customer satisfaction is through the roof. I've done, I'm on my, just starting my fourth one of these and I've got probably a dozen people that have been through all four of them just because what's next, what's next. They want to keep on going, keep on going. 
and they're getting, I, I'm seeing the results that they're getting is greater. Um, like I said, the customer satisfaction is greater. And the, um, there's that one book, you just need a thousand raving fans or something like that. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Like that. It's like yeah. anyone can make a six figure business on the internet if they have 1,000 raving yeah. fans. You don't need a giant list of 100,000 people. You exactly. need 1,000 a, a thousand fans that are rabid fans. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, I see some this a hundred fans, you know, it depends on your model. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I see this little process with these little mini courses. It's creating rabid fans. I mean, they are raving. They, they, when we sign off, love you, Matt. Thank you. This was great. Da, 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 da. Mercedes just did a, her first live event of the year, a little meetup group here in Vegas. And there was somebody that showed up that was in one of those courses of mine. Mm. And Tim, she only had 12 or 13 people there, but was, Oh my God. Matt, Epic Real Estate, we just went through his, his um, 10 day challenge course and that was the best $500 I ever spent. So we just heard that last night, right? Yeah. So it just kind of confirmed what I'm experiencing in the environment in that exchange. And it's, it's actually made this uh, whole business a lot more fun again. That's cool. Well, and that's, yeah, it's fun to put that kind of stuff together. And from a psychological selling standpoint uh you know number one it's uh you know you're you're focusing on one thing like we're gonna we're gonna we have this mini class it's gonna teach you how to do this one thing right if if if, if somebody's not interested in that thing they're not going they're not coming to the class they're not going to pay they're coming because they're interested in that one thing we're going to teach you how to get leads from this and convert them into this or we're going to show you how to take properties like this and and do this with them or wh whatever the method is that you're teaching but mm -hmm. it's one thing, right? Yeah. And so you're attracting just the people that want that one thing. Um, it's a digest. It's it's a short digestible format, so they feel like, uh, hey, I got this. I got this one thing. I've got. I feel like I've got mastery in this one little niche thing that I want to do now. And mm -hmm. it's like another arrow in my quiver, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the opposite of, hey, here's this system that gives you everything. And here's my mul my 1200 pound gorilla yeah. multi-tier you know, talking eight, more 8,000 right videos, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, which that makes me not want to buy. Right. Mm -hmm. If I look, if there are 12 million things I could do here, how do I even start? Where do I even know what to do? But if you say this thing is three hours or whatever it is, and it teaches mm -hmm. you this one thing. And when you're done with this, amount of time, you'll know this one thing. To me, that's really attractive. And I think that's what you're finding with your students. Totally. And that was, you know, it was inspired out of that conversation with Joe, but it was also introduced to me probably, I don't know, three months, right. When we went into quarantine uh, from Taki Moore and he had this whole thing, like the whole, whole industry has to change at this moment because we're all accustomed to, you know, for the last several years trying to sell the yacht. And now that we're in quarantine, everybody just wants to buy the life raft. Yeah. And you know what I mean? And yeah, I just didn't know good. what a life raft looked like in my business until I went and had that outing with Joe and like all those ideas came together and I was like, aha, uh -huh, got it. So I love it. I yeah. love it. That's awesome, man. So um, before we wrap up here, like what, what were one of those classes? Like what was the one thing you taught in one of those classes just to give people an idea of the content and something like that? Cool. So was it I, one that was really successful was I had a, a 10 day course on, and it was, I met with people for 10 days and it was how to get a contract signed in 10 days. That's all I do. Just, we're is. just going to get a contract signed. Mm -hmm. and so that one worked really well. Um, another one I did that worked really well was how to fill out the paperwork, how to craft creative offers and fill out the paperwork appropriately. Yep. Yeah. So, that was so, so that's so much more attractive than how to get your first deal in the next eight seconds and quit your job and buy the Lamborghini of your dreams and right. marry the woman of your dreams. It's just kind of like, yeah, whatever, dude. None of that's happening. But yeah. in the next 10 days, how to get a contract signed in the next 10 days, that is, I, I buy that, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you know, that makes sense to me. That seems possible. So uh, I think that goes back to what you're talking about, but just being authentic and being real with your people, just the methodology and what you're teaching, the very, the very subject of the course or the very subject of the mini workshop is congruent with, with you being authentic, right? You know, like we're going to teach you this one thing and you believe, and you know that, you, that this could be done in 10 days because it's not some insurmountable thing. You're not teach you how to scale Everest in five, five easy steps, you know, no, that's not, that's not how it works. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I love that, man. So here are the couple of things I was, I was writing some notes as you were talking and, uh, you gave us nuggets, dude. And I appreciate it. Uh, one was, you know, give all your best stuff away. 
You know, you built, you built your podcast audience by giving it all away, uh, by being real, right? By being radically authentic, by showing your scars, by, you know, talking about where you came from, you were bagging groceries and, and here's the story and here's how you came in. Right. Um, and, but did that in a, in a true way, authentic way. Um, and then being consistent, right. You know, so with the podcast, with your live events, even though the formats changed, you haven't stopped doing those. Right. Mm -hmm. And now you're adding in these mini workshops, these mini courses, and you're going to do those. It sounds like you've already done them fairly consistently. You're going to keep doing those because people are asking what's next, what's next, because they've digested it. They've used it. They put it to, they put it to use. And now they want the next thing to, they want mastery in the next thing. And they want to put that other arrow in their quiver because they want, you know, to be able to keep doing things that are going to keep growing their business. So those are the things that I got out. And then also attract, convert and exit. And we can apply that to almost any business, whether it's on the traditional real estate side or the education side, right? Attract, convert, and then exit. I love that. I think that's a, that's a great, uh, a great thing for us to keep in our minds. So, um, anything you would tell people, you know, before we sign up here, somebody who is, you know, just starting their podcast, maybe just starting, uh, their coaching business. We have a lot of successful real estate investors, uh, that are really good in their niche, whatever it is, whether it's multifamily or whether it's flipping houses or wholesaling houses or mobile homes or this or that. And now they're adding an educational component in, right? So just from an ideology standpoint, any, any advice of somebody who's just now starting to add that in? Um, yeah, I would say when I originally started the education part, I was thinking this was just going to be a, a cool little easy, convenient side stream income. And as you're going in, understand it's in a whole business all by itself. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, our real estate has always produced the majority of our income. And, but it looked like the education part was taking most of our time. Yeah. And so we made a commitment probably five or six years ago to do, if we're going to do the education, we got to do it right. And so we got that up to the level. So they're about even now, maybe the education has passed it a little bit. Um, but uh, those are two completely different businesses with completely different departments, completely different people involved in them. Yeah. So just understand it's a real business. It's not just like, Hey, I can just throw up a members area and put out a link and people are just going to buy it. It's yeah. just, it sounds that's great. Good, that's good advice. I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions. Oh, I'm going to start this little coaching business on the side. Well, you know, do you know how to teach? Do you know how to educate? Do you know how to create uh, front ends and back ends? Do you know how to set up merchant accounts? You know, I mean, it's a whole other business. Not that you can't take principles that made your traditional real estate business and, and convert them over, but, but the nuts and bolts of it, it's a whole different business, right? Mm -hmm. and, and an educational component to your business, whether you're educating buyers and sellers or whether you're starting and educating students who, who want to do what you do, uh, they can complement each other very well. And you're a great example of how those businesses kind of co-mingle and complement. And even, even with the marketing can co-mingle and complement. I'm sure you've got, you know, students and buyers from the same podcast because you're educating them both in a way at the same time, right? But it is a different and separate business. And so something you said earlier too that really rang true to me is, you know, you've been doing this for, for years, right? I mean, you've had your podcast for over a decade. Um, you've been operating an epic real estate's been operating at a high level. You've been one of the serious players in this industry for a while, but even you just in the last year or two had to say, man, I got to start operating like a real business. Yeah. You know, and just because you were good at flipping and creating turnkey properties and just because you were good at putting out a podcast, you still, even though by all people looking outside in would say, Oh, Matt's a baller and he's got all this stuff going on. You had to admit to yourself, I'm still not, really running this like a real business. I'm, I'm running, I'm doing good. I'm making money and I'm, but I'm doing it on grit and instinct instead of principles and real practices. So that, that's a big lesson for all of us. I think, you know, it's uh, you've got to know how to run a real business. And, and a lot of people uh, just kind of act like, Hey, you know, you, you think positive and you just keep rocking and rolling. And you're just going to make it. You can to an, to a certain extent, you and I are both examples of that in some ways. Right. But to get to that next level takes some real business acumen. And that's yeah. a decision that you've got to make. And you've got to seek out the right people to do it. So I love it, man. Thanks for being here with us, dude. This is a fun yeah, conversation, man. bro. Totally. I could keep on going. but uh, I, I know. Well, we are going to keep on going. We're going to have you back on multiple episodes because uh, this is uh, – I mean, I feel like we just scratched the surface here. So 
Uh, for those of you that, that don't know Matt, uh, now you know him. We're definitely going to have him back. I'm definitely going to dive deeper into his, uh, his beautiful bald head and that brain inside, which has got a lot of great lessons for me and for you. And uh, thank you guys for being here on the Real Estate Influencer Podcast. Listen, if you are not in the Real Estate Influencer Facebook group, that's where I'm hanging out. That's where Matt's hanging out. You get two mats for the price of one in that group. There might even be some other mats there. They may not be as bald and beautiful as we are, but they're, they're there. And everybody that is in our industry, the, the coaches, the product creators, software developers, group leaders, marketers, real estate entrepreneurs, that's who that group is for. And we're not selling anything to you there. That's a free group for you to join. If you're listening to this podcast and if this stuff makes sense to you, that's where you need to be. You need to be part of that community because we've just started the conversation here and the conversation can continue there. So that's where I'm hanging out. That's where people like Matt and other high level entrepreneurs like him and his wife Mercedes are hanging out and you'll see them there along with a lot of other people. So go to www.reiinfluencers.com. Again, that's www.reiinfluencers.com. That'll take you straight to the Facebook page. Just click on join. You'll answer a couple quick questions so we know about your business a little bit and you come in and you join that conversation. So thank you guys for being here. Matt, thanks again, buddy. Tell Mercedes we said hi. I look forward to seeing you in just a few days, man. We're going to have some fun yeah. and uh, I look forward to hanging with you. We don't do that often enough, so I'm really glad we're about to do it. And uh, we will definitely have you on some podcasts in the future and I appreciate your time, man. Thank you guys, whether you're listening on YouTube or on the Facebook page or on iTunes or maybe I think we're just jumping on to, uh, to Amazon now. I think Amazon is hosting podcasts. I just saw that actually. So this is probably going to be one of the first episodes that are on Amazon. But whatever platform you're listening on, we appreciate you. Reach out to us. Let us know uh, who should be on the show, what we should talk about, what we can do better, and do that in the Real Estate Influencer Facebook page. Thanks a lot, and we're signing off. We'll see you guys later. Hi there, Mr. Wonderful here talking about one of my favorite sectors of the economy, real estate. I don't care, commercial real estate, residential real estate, multifamily, you name it. Now, I want to do a big shout out. Congratulations for the success, for the success of the Family Mastermind and the Family Reunion event. You brought together the top real estate influencers in the country and created a community of power players. Keep up the great work. I mean, one of the things that's interesting is if you're in an industry like real estate, you want to meet others that are successful as well. There's a certain concept called the hive concept where you know sparrows group together when they do this to show each other that there's millions of them, that there's strength in numbers. Same idea here. I'm trying to use nature as an idea for why you'd want to get all the power players together. It's because they want to be together. They want to talk about their industry. They want to share ideas. It's a fantastic event. So Family Mastermind and the Family Reunion event were exactly that for real estate. Anyways, congratulations guys and keep up the good work. It's an industry that is never going to go away.